All right. So today's chapter uh, primarily focuses on one last concept that sort of is the last piece in the puzzle that we've been building. Uh, I must apologize in advance. It's a little esoteric. Um, it might stretch a little bit. So I, just kind of bear with me. And if you're like, yeah, I guess I can kind of see why we're doing that. That's probably good enough. If you try to pin it down a little too firmly, uh, I don't know, it might wriggle loose and run away on you. I don't know what it is at this point. I'm a little concerned. Um, so the diagrams are a little confusing. The whole topic is a little confusing. Ask as many questions as you need to. I may or may not have answers. We'll just see how it goes, all right? So notice there at the top, two basic concepts that we already have learned about. First of all, the idea that a current produces a magnetic field. We know this is Ampere's law. And let's just go ahead and write that down for completeness. Uh, B dot DL equals mu naught times I enclosed. As you can see below, we're going to revisit Ampere's law in just a second. The second concept that we already know about is that a changing magnetic field produces an electric field. We first learned about that in terms of a induced potential difference in magnetic field. Right at the end of chapter 29, we talked about it a little more broadly in terms of it creating an electric field. And of course, an electric field means you have a potential difference, which means you can have a current and all of that stuff can happen. So we could write that down as the more general form of Faraday's law. And that is E dot DL equals uh, the negative time rate of change of the electric, or excuse me, the magnetic flux. Ampere's law and Faraday's law. Um, the thing is, Ampere's law, as we've currently stated it, is just a little bit broken. And I'm going to talk through a particular example that sort of shows this little broken point, and we're going to use that one example to build out what the full equation should look like so it actually handles all the cases it's supposed to. I just want you to keep in mind, as we go through this one example, it's kind of like where, I don't know, like we have one case to prove something is false, like this is like one case of many that could be used, and you could use any one of those to sort of drive the exact same equation and so that it showed that it's true for all of them, all right? So don't get hung up too much on this one that I'm going to seemingly just like pull out of the air, okay? So Ampere's Law. We talked about Ampere's Law in terms of, say, a closed circular path, we going around a wire that contains current. We looked just at that circular path, and we used the equation up above B dot DL around that path and talked about the current that passed inside of that path, that was enclosed by that path. One way we didn't describe it that might be a little bit better is that there is a surface that's bounded by that path, and we're talking about the current that passes or breaks through that particular surface. That's labeled as surface one in this diagram. That's the part we already know about. The thing is that if Ampere's law is really going to work, you should be able to say that, well, the surface really doesn't matter. I can choose any surface that's bounded by that path that I've chosen, and I should get the exact same result. So for whatever reason, they've drawn this oblong sort of weird shaped surface just to represent another one that could work. So you can see that represented here as surface two, and let me label that in a different color. That is not enough of a different color. Like all of this sort of stretched out surface area, you can see also has the same current that's sort of breaking that surface at one point. So whichever surface that I'm talking about has to enclose or have the surface or the current break through it, in this case, both of them are fine. The surface that I choose really doesn't matter because if you go back up to the equation, uh, B dot DL, that's about the path that I've chosen. It's really just about I enclosed. Can I choose any surface that's bounded by that circle or has it as one edge and have the same current pass through it? Now, you can just sort of let your imagination run wild at this point and just imagine surfaces of all sorts of shape that just have at one end of it a circle. And you can see that in some cases, well, maybe the current I goes through it. And in other cases, maybe no current at all passes through it. So we've got a situation where I need to be able to handle all of those other potential surfaces that I could choose that maybe don't have the same amount of current passing through them. 
The key is that I can't have the magnetic field be dependent on some imaginary surface that's being bounded by that current loop, or excuse me, by the closed path, rather. Okay? So on the next slide, we're going to pick a random circuit that has a surface bounded by a circular path that illustrates that Ampere's law is broken. Okay? So let's slide over, and now we've got this. Oh, I agree. Bless you. It almost deserves a sneeze or something. It's like, blah, blah. like that's terrible. I don't want to look at that. All right? So now they've just sort of like flipped that surface inside out. Instead of having it go down and have the current still pass through it, they decided to let it spread out. And you might imagine there's like a circular sort of part that's the back end of that. So we have a smaller circle, and the back end is a larger circle. And that larger circle at the other end happens to sit right in the middle of a parallel plate capacitor and a seemingly really, really oversized parallel plate capacitor, okay? Now, if you think about it, well, there's no current in that location. So this region in between the two plates, that's an open circuit. There's an electric field that's there, but there's no actual charge flow in that region of space, which means if I try to consider, well, how much current is passing through this back surface area? Well, there's none. There's zero, which means if I choose surface two in this case, I've got an inconsistency in Ampere's law. It means that it looks something like this. Now we've got uh, integral B dot DL is equal to mu naught I enclosed. And we could say that this side is now zero because there is no current that's passing through closed surface number two, or excuse me, open surface number two. But there still is a magnetic field, so this side is not equal to zero. Okay? So the B dot DL part is talking about this closed path that's going around this current, and I know there's a magnetic field there. So the left side has to be non-zero, but the right side is talking about this circle at the back and this entire like weird thing here where the current that I would be talking about would have to go in through that back part, that back circle, and there's nothing there, okay? So we've got this at least one particular case where one side is zero, one side's not. So what happened was that Maxwell came along uh, good old Maxwell. We're going to talk about his equations here in just a minute, which was really just an assembly of a bunch of previous equations that were sort of restructured, and a lot of stuff was done with them. We'll talk about that in a moment. He said that for cases like this or for other potential surfaces, we need another term in Ampere's law to sort of handle those cases as well. Something else needs to be there. So here's what we can say. There's only going to be a current in this particular wire if something is happening back here, like if you imagine the capacitor's in a state of charging or discharging, then I'm going to have charges that are leaving that plate and working its way around a circuit and going to this other plate. If it's fully charged or fully discharged, well, it's just going to be sitting there. There's no current. There's no magnetic field. There is an electric field, but it's not changing, okay? So the only way that I can have a current and a magnetic field is if charge is leaving the capacitor are going to the capacitor. Everyone still good with that? Yeah? And if charge is growing or decreasing on the capacitor plates, then we could say that this electric field that's in between is also changing. There's a changing electric field that's happening in this back region of surface two. Let me pause there for a second, see if there's anything I wanted to write down about that, which there's not, and see if you have any questions following perhaps so far in the back say which part again yeah so if charges are leaving the positive side working their way around the circuit in an effort to discharge so the amount of charge on the plates is decreasing as the charge amount decreases then this electric field would be decreasing in strength if charge is going to the plates then the field is growing okay so in that back region, we're talking about a changing electric field. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some capacitor equations we've talked about before. So first of all, Q is equal to CV. 
The amount of charge that's on there is related to the capacitance and the potential difference across uh, the two plates. Uh, for the parallel plate capacitor, we said that that's related to the electric field by that equation, where the electric field times the plate separation gives me the potential difference. And also for a parallel plate capacitor, we can say that the capacitance is epsilon naught A over D. So these two are for parallel plate. And we're going to take this V equation and put it in there, and that C equation and put it in there. So let's see. Now we've got Q is equal to epsilon naught A over D for the first part times E D. The D's cancel, and I just have epsilon naught A E represents how much charge is on the plates of the capacitor. And you can see at this point we have this connection between how much charge is there and how much electric field is there. But we want to talk specifically about when the charge is changing or the electric field is changing because that's the only time I get current and can connect it back to a magnetic field. So we can say that uh, um, changing Q causes changing E. at the same rate. They are connected to each other. And that's going to allow me to rewrite this equation as dq dt, the rate at which the current is changing on the plates is equal to epsilon naught a d e dt, the time rate of change of the electric field. What is this thing? dQ dt. That's just current, right? Okay. And if I were to say, uh, I don't know, put all of this together, A and dE dt, can I re-express that as something? Anybody? Anything? That's flux, right? That's electric flux. So this is uh, electric flux specifically through surface two. Back there at the back of that weird shape. That's the electric flux through surface two. If it helps, remember the surface is an arbitrary shape, that really doesn't matter. If you would like to just imagine that surface two, again, is just a circle here at the back, that's totally fine. We're talking about the amount of electric flux that's going through that back circle that sits right in between the plates of the capacitor, okay? So we are going to use this equation to make a modification to uh, Ampere's law. And it looks something like this. Actually, let's rewrite this first. We could say that I is epsilon naught uh, times the rate of change of electric flux. This thing is what's known as the displacement current. You can see that it's directly related to the rate of change of the electric field, how fast that electric field is changing which is tied back to the charges that are leaving the plates and how fast they're leaving. Here's the weird thing about displacement current. That's just what Maxwell called it based on how things were at the time. I guess it's an artifact of history. In fact, uh, I haven't read the paper, but I'm told if you go back and read that paper, like Maxwell explains this in a very, very sort of different way where he's making up some other stuff and it's like the terminology is all weird and wrong based on what we know today. But a lot of good stuff came out of it because, like, we built on that eventually. So, first of all, keep in mind that in between the plates of the capacitor, we're calling something their current, but there is no current. There is no charge flowing. He's just imagining that something there is contributing to the magnetic field. So we should probably put air quotes around that current. It's not a current. Also, displacement. Where's the displacement? There's no displacement either. So this whole term is just terrible and broken, but it's survived through history. So there's no displacement, there's no current, but this thing is called displacement current for whatever reason. 
I apologize for Maxwell and for everyone who's come after him for not fixing it. Yeah. There's no current because we're specifically talking about uh, this region of space in between the plates. And we're talking about what's happening to that rear surface where there's an electric field that's changing, but there's no charge that's flowing in that particular location. There is no charge that's flowing. Anybody else? Okay, yeah. It's, it's trying to get at the idea that we know currents cause magnetic fields. It's trying to make the connection that a changing electric field can also give rise to a magnetic field by means of a made-up current, let's say. Okay? So another method of producing a magnetic field besides what we've already learned about. All right? So, how is this going to modify um, Ampere's law? So, let's write this as new Ampere's law. It looks something like this. The left-hand side is exactly like before. But now we're going to say on the right-hand side, there are two different currents that are enclosed. There's the current we had before, which we might call a conduction current, it's actually charges flowing through a wire that's giving rise to a magnetic field. And we're going to add to that this new type of current, which is known as the displacement current. So we'll write that as I sub D. Now, you don't necessarily have both of these all the time, right? If I decide to do a path that's not in a place that doesn't wrap around a conduction current, well, then you just ignore that displacement current altogether. It only comes into play when I'm in a space where there's not conduction current, or you can imagine maybe really, really complicated situations where perhaps there's some combination of both, but we're not going to do any of that in this class. Okay? So what this is trying to say, if we write it out completely, let's uh, write it in terms of everything that we know. We've got uh, mu naught times I plus... What does the uh, displacement current look like? Mu naught times epsilon naught times the rate of change of electric flux. In other words, current uh, creates magnetic field. That's what we knew before. But also, ooh, we can say that changing electric flux creates magnetic field. It's adding another source for magnetic fields, and it turns out we just don't do a lot with it in this class. Simply to fully present Maxwell's equations at the end of this lecture, well, we have to give you the full version of this particular equation. Who's got questions or complaints or anything before we do an example with this that might help it make a little bit more sense? Question? Uh, I guess you can come up with a reason to call it that. I don't know. It's, it's analogous to a current in a way because currents give rise to magnetic fields. So it's like we're calling this other phenomenon something that we already know makes magnetic fields. It's a bit of a stretch, but... All right, let's do an example. An example, Ampere's Law Revisited Example. So we've got a capacitor with air in the middle, 30 picofarads, uh, it has circular plates, and we're given the area of the plates. It's charged by 70 volts through a 2-ohm resistor. Uh, we are going to say that at the instant the battery is connected, that's when the electric field is changing most rapidly. I think that makes sense because that's the point when there's the most charge flowing to the capacitor, and then after that it ramps down as the plates begin to fill up. So that should be the point when we have the largest change uh, in electric flux and in electric field. So we're going to look particularly at that point and find a few different things. The first two of these are going to serve as a bit of a review 
but it'll help us tie everything together, I think, a little bit. So let's see. For part A, we're trying to find the current into the plate. You might remember we have this equation for uh, the charge on the plates of the capacitor. Yeah, from a few chapters back. I'm going to show you the hard way and the easy way to get at what we want to find. So if we want to find the current at this particular instant, right at the start, just when the plates uh, or the battery is connected, we want to find the rate that the current or the charge is moving. So in other words, we would like to find uh, dq dt specifically at t equals zero, right at the start. So we're going to take the derivative of that right side. So we'll say we're looking for uh, ddt of C V naught minus C V naught E to the minus T over R C. So the first term gives me nothing. And uh, let's see, the second term is going to give me uh, minus C V naught. And then I've got the minus one over R C in the exponential. That's gonna come out front. So I've got minus one over R C e to the minus t over rc. And we're going to evaluate that at t equals zero. So let me complete the right-hand side, or the left-hand side once again. There we go. So let's see, the c's cancel, and we've got two negative signs, so those will go away. And what is e to the zero? That's just one, so we'll get rid of that. And now all I have is just, uh, huh, V naught over R. Well, that just went away quickly, okay? Well, hmm, I'm saying the current at this point in time is V naught over R. In other words, we just did a lot of work to end up with Ohm's law once again. You gotta love that, right? Huh, yeah, that was exactly what we were looking for. Just keep in mind, right at the start, remember when I make that first connection to the capacitor, charge freely flows at that instant. It's almost like the capacitor has a short circuit in the middle, as if it's not even there, as if charge can flow freely, which means that the only thing that's in the circuit is the potential difference that I'm supplying and the resistance. So it makes sense at that point that the current should be the maximum amount of current given by Ohm's law. So let's make a little note here. It's, uh, we could say that the capacitor behaves like a short circuit. Okay, so our result agrees with sort of theoretically what we would expect to happen. We could calculate that value. I'm not going to bother, all right? So let's move on to part B, the rate of change of electric field between the plates. So now that we've got the current at that point in time, we want to find out at the same point in time how fast the electric field is changing because that's going to allow me to move toward finding the magnetic field and that displacement current along the way. So let's see, from a previous chapter, let's say uh, from, I think, chapter 21, maybe? Ugh, that's going back a little bit. We can say that the electric field in between the plates is equal to sigma over epsilon naught. Go back, look at your notes, study. Somewhere back there, we solved this particular problem for these parallel plates and found the electric field in between. Yay. Uh, so we could rewrite that as Q over A for the charge density, epsilon naught. And we are concerned about the rate of change of the electric field. So that's going to be this. And the area is physical. That's not changing. Epsilon naught is a constant. So the only thing that's changing there is potentially Q. So I've got 1 over A epsilon naught D Q D T. And once again, what is DQ DT? That's just I. So we could rewrite that as I over A epsilon naught. And if I'm specifically trying to find the rate of change of electric field at that same instant, well, then I could use the current that I solved for above, and we could plug that in and find that exact value. But let's not worry about that either. Okay? Any questions about A or B? Good so far? Yes. 
Q over A, epsilon naught, the Q over A comes from the surface charge density, sigma. And the original equation, sigma over epsilon naught, is just from a previous problem. Anybody else? No? Part C, and this is where things get to use something new. Determine the magnetic field induced between the plates. And we're going to assume that we have a uniform magnetic field in that region in between the two circles, and also that there is no electric field that's like leaking, that's outside of the plates. It's basically perfect in the middle and nothing on the outside, all right? You can see a diagram of this on the top right. So we're just looking down on one of the plates on the inside with sort of ignoring the other one. So we've got a, an electric field that's pointing directly at us going to the other plate. And we're going to, by analogy from what we learned at the end of chapter 29, make the assumption that we have circles of magnetic field inside. If you go back and look at the diagrams where we were sort of thinking about this in reverse, that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. You might remember that last slide we had in chapter 29 where, oh, if one was perpendicular, the other one made circles around it. So it sort of makes sense that we would have circles of magnetic field in this particular case too. So part C, part C. Let's uh, talk about a few different cases here. So first of all, let's say um, between the plates. In other words, if you look back at that diagram, we're going to say for R less than R naught. At points that are physically in between the two plates, we're going to try to find the magnetic field. So we will use our new version of Ampere's Law. Aren't you excited? Yes? Okay, fantastic. New version of Ampere's Law. I can sense the excitement. It's palatable. You're more excited about this than any banana you've ever eaten. Yeah, I know it's true. What's the first change I'm going to make to this, though? Remember, we're in between the two plates. I enclosed is zero. There is no physical conduction current that's happening in between the plates. So we can set that term to zero. It's only a change in, mag in electric field that's creating a magnetic field in between the plates. So let's see. We could rewrite the left-hand side as B times the circumference, which is 2 pi R. And the right-hand side, mu naught, epsilon naught, uh, times the derivative with respect to time of the electric flux, which is just going to be the electric field times the area that it's passing through. So that's going to be the value of the electric field times pi r squared, because we're dealing with a circle. So let's see. Let's rearrange this and solve for b. So on this side, I've got uh, mu naught, epsilon naught, pi r squared times the rate of change of electric field, and we'll divide by 2 pi r. So the pi's cancel. The pi's cancel. I make myself cry. Hate for the pi's to cancel. It's just terrible. And we have mu naught, epsilon naught, r over 2 times DE DT. That is the magnetic field between the plates, so specifically for R less than R naught, where R naught is the size or the radius of the plates themselves. That wasn't too bad, right? Yeah? Okay? I didn't think so. Questions? Thoughts? Ampere's Law. Beautiful, don't you think? Just say yes. I think we should, like, revisit that agreement we made all the way at the start of the semester where I'm allowed to, like, ask things of you, excitement, and you're allowed to lie. Just blatantly just express all the excitement in the world, even if it's not there. So pretty fantastic, huh? Extended Ampere's Law? Yeah, I thought so, yeah. So let's continue and talk about outside the plates, so we're not moving over to where there's actually a wire. We're just talking about this capacitor. So instead, I'm going to say that R is greater than R naught. And if we go back to the previous 
uh, place, you could say we're looking at a path that's out here somewhere. So we're outside the capacitor, the circular capacitor altogether. And it's not going to change a whole lot. So let's start with the extended version of Ampere's law. B dot DL equals mu naught I enclosed plus mu naught, epsilon naught, D flux DT. And again, in that region, there is no current that's being enclosed by that circle. We would have to move away from the capacitor into the circuit somewhere to have that term come into play. And then if we did that, then we wouldn't have the second term that we have to worry about. Okay, so we're dealing with one or the other. So still, on the left-hand side, we've got B2 pi R. On the right-hand side, we've got mu naught, epsilon naught, times the derivative with respect to time of the flux, which is going to be E times pi R naught squared. That's the full area of the plates themselves. We've got all of the electric flux. There is none on the outside. So we could say this is uh, all the E is between the plates. I think those plates should have pi. Hmm. No pi for me today. I can't remember the last time I had pi. Pi is not served enough. It's always cake. Who wants cake? Ah, you do? Really? Wouldn't you rather have pie? Hmm. My wife hates cake. And, and it's, like, it's like me and bananas, right? Like someone's like, well, what about this? You, this banana bread is delicious. You'll love it. I'll be like, no, I won't. I'm going to hate it. With her, someone's like, this is the best cake ever. You're going to love this cake. And she knows in advance she's not going to like it. Nope. She'll just throw the cake right back in their face. And then they'll be sad, so they never should have offered cake. Just give her pie. She'll be happier. I'd rather have pie, too. So let's solve this also for B. So we've got mu naught, epsilon naught over 2 pi r, and uh, hmm, I've got pi r naught squared d e d t. Again, the pi is canceled. Hmm. So mu naught, epsilon naught, r naught squared over 2 r d e d t gives me the magnetic field anywhere outside the plates for r greater than r naught. And again, for both of these, if we really wanted to, I think we have enough information we could solve these numerically, but what's the point? Let me make that a little bigger. Ooh. But here's sort of the point of all this, all right? Let's uh, sort of pull things together just a little bit and use that equation where, again, we're outside of the plates altogether. And we already have an equation for the changing electric field from above. We had this, d e d t. Why am I writing so much smaller now? I don't know. Equals I over epsilon naught a, and let's plug that in there. So that means we're going to be finding b outside, if you want to think about it that way. B out, perhaps. So let's write that as b out. Now equals mu naught, epsilon naught, r naught squared over 2r. And now for de dt, I have i over epsilon naught a. Epsilon naught is canceled. I'm okay with that. I don't have a problem with that one. And uh, so now we've got mu naught, r naught squared, i over 2r. And there's an a. So um, that a is, again, just pi r naught squared because we're looking at the entire thing, uh, the entire capacitor plates. So now R naught squared is canceled. And now what are we left with? I feel like we've seen that before. Have we? Have you? You've seen a lot this semester, haven't you? At this point, who knows what you've seen and what you haven't? Where have we seen that equation? Yeah, that was the magnetic field just around a long straight wire. Hmm. So same as B uh, for long straight wire. Which means it's kind of like this. If I have a wire and then, well, maybe that wire is broken just a little bit by 
a capacitor that's kind of hiding in the middle. Okay? And there's a current that's passing through this. And I can use the right-hand rule to find the magnetic field that's wrapping around that wire. At all points above and below and behind that wire, we know that it's given by mu naught I over 2 pi R. But even at, say, this location, not between the plates of the capacitor, but outside at some point, you have the exact same equation that results. So in a way, uh, it almost is really like the current just kind of kept going, right? We got the exact same result outside. The only place it's different is like actually in between the plates itself, where we saw that a changing magnetic electric field gives rise to a magnetic field, and it really does behave like a current. So you might just wonder, like, why we bothered to do any of that? Yeah, because we got the exact same result right at the end. Here's what we might add to this. This displacement current that's in here and this current that's there, they're equal to each other. That's the only way that I can get the same value for the magnetic field surrounding the wire. Okay? So I and ID are the same. They're just coming from different places. One is from a physical conduction current. One is the result of a changing electric field. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's almost like the there's a physical current and then kind of a virtual current that carries over because of the attractive and repulsive nature of the charges, and then the exact same current continues on the other side. It just kind of, it's like a ghost current in the middle that floats across in a weird way, all right? That is all that we want to say about this extended Ampere's law and the displacement current. Any questions or thoughts before we do the last two slides of the semester? No? Okay. Let's revisit Gauss's law. It's like we're, we're playing all the old hits today. You know, everybody loved Gauss's law. So let's revisit Gauss's law once again. We had Gauss's law for electricity, for electrostatics. What we didn't talk about is Gauss's law for magnetism. And this is really, really quick. We already know that there are no magnetic monopoles, meaning I can't just take the north pole of a magnet and leave with it. If I carry the north pole away, I'm going to be carrying a south pole with it. They come in pairs, north and south poles, which means that um, we can write an equation that looks a lot like Gauss's law, but applies to the magnetic field instead. So we could write something that looks like this, B dot DA instead of E dot DA, which we had for uh, Gauss's law originally, is equal to zero. Well, that's a boring equation. Okay, you might remember our previous Gauss's law looked something like this. It was E dot dA equals what? Anybody? Yeah, Q enclosed over epsilon naught. That said that if there was going to be any flux through the closed surface, that it must be because that closed surface had a charge. There was some charge inside that was basically a place where the field lines could start or end so they wouldn't all just like enter and exit and give me no net flux. Because I can't have a pole all by itself, it's essentially saying that there are no magnetic charges. I can't just take the pole by itself and have the field lines originate there or end there. Um, they don't start, they don't stop, they just exist in these closed loops, which we can see over on the right for the bar magnet. Every one of those field lines, even the ones that are at the two ends, if we were to draw the full magnetic field, it eventually wraps around and forms a closed loop. So there is no net flux in all cases for magnetic fields. Whatever surface we decide to draw, one here, one there, it doesn't matter. All the field lines that enter are also going to exit, and you always get zero, all right? We're not going to do any problem with that. I just need to give you that one last equation because... Well, then they all sort of come together as Maxwell's equations. Notice everything that's there, we've learned about. 
you should recognize everything that's on the screen. What's the top one? Yeah, that's our original Gauss's Law. The second one is what we just learned as Gauss's Law for Magnetism. What's the third one? You guys are on a roll. You're fast. You're so fast. I'm just impressed. It is Faraday's Law. And the last one? Yeah, that's our new Ampere's Law. All as a unit, these are known as Maxwell's equations because he was the first one to sort of take everything that had been done and put it together and say that these four laws describe everything in electromagnetism. So everything that we did this semester and anything that you would ever want to do lives inside those equations, which is kind of a powerful thing. Now, keep in mind, what we've written here, notice the, the mu naught and epsilon naught, this is for free space. This is specifically in a vacuum. We would have to make some modifications, first of all, if we're dealing with some material. So if you're inside something that's not a vacuum, all of a sudden this has changed a little bit. If you look online, you can see that these can also be expressed in a differential form. And then depending on other situations, they're modified a bunch of other ways as well. But it all comes back to the same four equations and just sort of different versions of those four equations. The thing that Maxwell did in addition to just combining these was he made a prediction. Um, if you look in the book, there is a, oh, I don't know, maybe a three-page derivation that we're not doing in this class where you work through a bunch of stuff like applying Faraday's law and Gauss's law to like an imaginary situation. <laughs> I know, you want to do that again, right? This is the process that Maxwell took to predict that there must be something known as uh, electromagnetic waves. He said that electric and magnetic fields could exist in such a way that a wave-like pattern was formed. And I know you look at the equations, it looks like that can't possibly be hiding in there somewhere, but it's not beyond what we've learned in this class. If you go back and look in the text, it's a bit of a mess. I've got it here in my notes if we had the time to do it and we're supposed to cover that section in this class, which we're not. It's not that bad, and you can actually sort of do that proof as well. But he also used these equations uh, to predict how fast these waves should travel. And once you solve it, you end up with an equation that looks like this. Those two constants that have sort of been with us all semester. All right, somebody grab a calculator. What was mu naught? Four pi times 10 to the minus seven. And epsilon naught was uh, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. What do you get? Maybe, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. I want to see if the, a certain number comes out of your calculators because it looks like it just isn't going to. I'm looking at your calculator. Huh. I see 299863380.5 or about 2.99 times 10 to the 8th meters per second which we know to be C, the speed of light, right? So it's like this has been hiding all semester, the mu naught and the epsilon naught combining in that way to give us a number that we know. The thing was, in Maxwell's time, like, people knew what light was, right? They looked at stuff all the time. They'd even made measurements of the speed of light, doing really complicated experiments like opening a lantern on one mountain and then over on a different mountain be like, I see it, and like, you know, really complicated, non-precise measurements. You get the idea, though. And they knew that it was pretty much in this ballpark even then. But they didn't know what light was. They had no idea. So then Maxwell puts these equations together, makes this prediction, and you can imagine him, like, like at night with a lantern or something and his quill being like, I wonder what the velocity is. And then he gets the number that people knew was the speed of light, and he's like... Now I know what light is. It's this thing that I'm predicting with my equations. It must be some combination of electric and magnetic fields. Alas, I'm awesome, I guess. You know, I mean, what else could you say at that point? Here's the sad part of all of this. 
uh, we could say that uh, none of this was experimentally verified. In other words, actual production and measurement of electromagnetic waves until eight years after he died. So it's like, at one point, he has this great moment where he's like, I know what it is. This has to be true. But he wasn't proven right until after his death. So, yay. Oh, kind of all mixed together, right? I think that's about it. Does anybody have any questions, comments, complaints? Anything you want to throw at me or at the board? Please don't throw anything. Your question. Is it an exception? I would call it a special case. It lives inside there. All right. Good luck on the exam, everybody.